So let's go before the Lord. And let's ask the Holy Spirit tonight to, to teach us and to lead us into, our, into his truth in, in, in our lives. Father, we come before you today and we just thank you that we get to come into your house. We don't come here tonight to fulfill a ritual or a traditional obligation, uh, obligation. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. Lord, I pray that it's not about just the words of a man or the, the thought out message of a man. But Lord, I pray that it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, the God breathed inspiration of your word that speaks into our lives as we study your will, as we study your life, as we study what you have for us. God, I pray that we would grab a hold of that with eyes open to see, minds open to receive, hearts open to, 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 to get what you have for us, that we would leave this place tonight night, well equipped to represent Jesus Christ in an abundant life that he's given to us today. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you, invite you, and to teach us, to lead us, and to guide us. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Romans in the eighth chapter, Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight is what many theologians and scholars call or refer to as the great eight. Yeah, Romans might, be, might very well be one of Paul the Apostle's greatest works or one of the greatest uh, literary works in the Bible, in the New Testament for sure. And, and the eighth chapter of Romans is the greatest chapter of all of this. And so they call it the great eight. There's so much good truth in that. And tonight I want to talk to you about a subject. I'm going to title it if you're taking notes, if you want to refer to it later on. I'm going to t- uh, title it, Make Up Your Mind. You know what I'm talking about? Make up your mind. Have you ever just had your mind set on something that, like, doesn't matter what's going on around you? It doesn't matter what logic is, is screaming at you in the face. Your mind is made up, and you're like, forget it. So I'm going to share with you. It's kind, of, it's kind of still fresh on my heart, so I figured I'll share with you. You know, my wife and I, we got this. Somebody gave us, we traded some, a family member, one of those um, security camera systems where you can, like, uh, go on your phone and see all of, like, what's going on. And the way our house is situated, we can't, like, you know, we live in a cookie-cutter home, and we can't see our front yard. You know, our garage blocks the street view, and we can't see anything that goes on in the front of our house just by the way it's set up. And so we thought, well, you know, we've got this security camera system. Why don't we put it up? It's been in a closet for literally, like, three years and my wife's been getting on me about it so I had a friend come over a family member he came over and he kind of helped me put up the cameras and we drilled a hole through the wall and ran him into a thing and, and we had it all set up but we had to do some additional I had to do some additional footwork to get it all set up and so we had all the parts in and they were laying all around the house and the house had been kind of a big mess for a couple of weeks because it was a project I started three weeks ago and I got yesterday this is, this is why I say it was fresh because yesterday I got it in my mind I was like I'm finishing this today And all I had to do was to drill a little hole in my wall, about an inch inch wide hole, to pass some cables through one of the walls to, to plug all the stuff into the internet and all that stuff. Really simple job, really easy, really like not complicated at all. So I got everything ready to go. Got the big drill bit in my drill and, and I'm sitting there and, and you know, I, it had been a hot day. It was really humid yesterday. I was kind of, kind of wiped out, kind of frustrated. I stepped on some Legos trying to figure this whole process out. And if you're a parent and you have kids with Legos, whenever you step on a Lego, I just want you to know the Lord does not judge what comes out of your mouth. <laughs> There's grace and mercy on you. And, you know, my wife, Stacy, she's like, Luke, why don't you just take a break? Just, 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 just wait. You know, you're frustrated. You don't need to do it. You're rushing through it to get it done. And I'm like, you know, my mind was made up. I was set. Like, it didn't matter what anybody was going to say. I was like, no, I'm finishing this. I'm going to be done. And so sure enough, I get up on this little footstool ladder and get up there to drill a hole because it's kind of high up in the wall. I start drilling a hole. Mind you, this is an inch big hole. So it's not like a little tiny pinhole, like a nail hole that you can put putty over. It's an inch big nail, so uh, in big hole. So I start drilling the hole. Sure enough, the, I didn't even measure it, didn't do anything. I just eyeballed it. You know, you do that, your mind's made up, like I know where it's going. Sure enough, the first hole I drill goes right into a stud. So now I've got this big inch wide hole that I'm going to have to go and patch. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I don't want to hit a stud, so I'm going to move way over here to the wall, and I'm going to drill it again. And all of a sudden, so I start drilling, and, and, and my friend was there. He was gonna, I was going to drill the hole, and he was going to look at where on the wall it was so that we can pass the cables through. So he's on this spot. It's supposed to go into a closet in my room, and I'm drilling this hole, and all of a sudden, on the outside of the closet, outside of the exterior wall, like where there's a picture frame, all of a sudden, the drill bit pushes through the wall. So I drilled a hole in my wall, one inch thick, through two different walls, and it was in the wrong location. So now I've got two one inch thick holes to repair in the wall. So finally on the third time, I get it. And I'm about like done. You know, I'm like throwing the drill, using high school words and all these different things. Sweat's dripping off of me, and the kids are like, Daddy, are you okay? And 
It's like, don't talk to me right now. So finally I got it all done. But you know, it's funny is that sometimes in life we go through that, right? You've ever been in that place where your mind is just made up? Like, it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing. You've made a decision. And you say, you know what? From that moment forward, I do not care what comes at me. I don't care if it's the wrong decision. I'm just making a decision. And we live our lives like that so much. And I remember my mom growing up. My mom, Pastor Deborah, always used to tell me, son, we don't see life as it is. We see life as we are. And sometimes we look at what is going on around us and we say, well, that is just what it is or this is just how it is. But really what we're doing is we're seeing life. We're seeing circumstances or events or, or, or current happenings in our lives or around us. We're seeing them through the lens of our own perspective of things that have happened to us, of experiences that we've had in the past, the things that we want to see in the future. And we look through life through the lens of, the, of our experiences of our own perspective. And what I find so amazing about perspective is that people can look at the same thing and see completely different things out of it because we see things all from our own unique perspective. As a matter of fact, I, I kind of want to give you a, a social experiment. So I, I'm going to put up that image and, and I want you to tell me what you see. So let's put up that, that first image. There's an image on the screen and and, and this, is, this is the drawing. It's one of those optical illusions. So just by, by raising your hands, let me step out of the way so you can see it. Just by raising your hands, how many of you in this place tonight see a young woman? Raise your hand. All right, how many of you, you know, put your hands down. How many of you in this place tonight see an old woman? What is it? Is it a young woman or is it an old woman? And you're like, oh, it's both, Pastor. Like, I've seen that on Facebook. <laughs> it's amazing that you can look at something and you can see two completely different things. Let's put up the next one. How many of you guys see in this image two faces? How many of you guys see like a candlestick or a goblet? Isn't it interesting that you can see two different things from the same image? Now, now let's go a little bit deeper. Let's, 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 let's bring some hostility into the room tonight, okay? I'm going to ask you this question. Are these lines crooked or are they straight? Are they crooked? How many think they're crooked? How many think they're straight? How many think they're crooked? How many are like, I don't care? <laughs> There's going to be a fight in the parking lot tonight. Like, no, oh, those lines were straight, I'm telling you. All right, one more, just one more, just for the fun of it, just for the fun of it. Are there three pegs or four pegs in this picture? Three or four? You hear the mumbling? I imagine this is what Moses heard in the wilderness, and the, the murmur amongst the crowd. It's amazing that you can look at things, and from your perspective, through what you've experienced in life, through how you view things, through, through your natural inclination, you can see something that somebody right next to you can see something completely different. Because the fact of the matter is that when we go through life, we do not see it as it is. We see life as we are, through the lens of our own perspectives. And so often our minds are made up in a certain direction, in a certain way, in a certain thought process, in a certain pattern. And today I want to talk to you about something about the subject of making up your minds. Because here in Romans, the eighth chapter, Paul just finishes this massive discourse on living the life through Jesus Christ and how we've been crucified to the old and we've been made alive in Jesus and we're no longer slaves to sin but now servants or bond servants to, to a life in Christ. And then Paul says, man, I, I, I find that there is a battle within me, this, this, this war, you could say it like this, this war of perspectives, the perspective of my flesh or of myself and the perspective of my spirit or my soul. And he says, the things that I want to do, it seems like I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do are like the things that I do. And I find that my flesh or myself is warring or battling against my spirit and my soul. And he says, oh, who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Because he says, I'm seeing things from two different perspectives. 
And then he enters the great eight by saying in Romans 8, chapter, verse number one, there is therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So whenever you step on a Lego, parents, just remember, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But he goes further on and he starts talking about this, this mindset or this perspective. And Paul says in Romans the 8th chapter, now I'm going to cheat a little bit tonight and I'm going to read out of my reading translation rather than what we teach out of, the, out of here in the, in the Rock Church. We usually use a new King James translation, but I read at home out of an English standard version. It's just a little bit modern, more modern English. Both of them are essential translations or, or literal translations, which they take word for word. And they just, the, the vernacular is a little bit easier to understand. And so Paul says in Romans the 8th chapter, it'll read pretty much the same if you have a new King James Bible. So still, still open it because that's what we're here to do. Paul says these words and he says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds. So he's talking about mindsets. He says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, that's a capital S speaking of the spirit of God. Or, or Jesus. Those who live according to the Spirit, once again he says, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So he talks about these two mindsets. And now we're not talking new age mindset, like, you know what, here's some positive thinking, and just as long as you try to do the best you can at, you know, having a good mindset. Paul says, listen, there is a literal mindset that we have in life, and we have a mindset of self or of flesh or we have the mindset of the Spirit or of God. And if we set our minds or if we live our lives made up with the mind made up in the things of the flesh, he goes on and says the next verse, that is to live towards death. For to set the mind on flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And so Paul says basically, essentially, you and I in our lives have two options to live by, to have a mindset of ourselves, to live for myself, to live the way I think, the way I see it, the way I want, or to live my life with the mindset or the mind made up according to the things of God. And so he says, you have an option in your life. Do you want death or do you want life? I think nobody in this place would choose death. Like, man, you know, I really, really want to live a life of death. Everybody wants life and peace. But have you ever found out that sometimes it's not just that easy? It's not just to say, well, I choose life. Like, it's a struggle. It's a battle. There's this war. There's this war of perspectives that come at us from all different directions in life. And today, I wanted to just do something. I wanted to share with you a message that changed my life, that changed my perspective, that helped to, for me to bring something that Jesus said we would have, and that is life to bring joy, to, to not have to look at this walk uh, with Jesus as something that I'm continually dying because we do die to the flesh, but we live to the spirit. And just I wanted to share with you an encouragement that I believe that if we would look at the mindsets of what God has for us, that we would leave encouraged. We wake up tomorrow morning. When you go to work, you'll feel encouraged. When you, when you deal with your family members, you'll feel encouraged because God has something for you in the mindset of the Spirit. He says, life and peace. How many of you guys want the peace of God? The Paul the Apostle says that surpasses all understanding and guards our hearts and our minds. And so what I'm going to do tonight is I don't normally do points or, or multiple things, but I'm just going to share three. I'm sure that there's probably 300 things that we could compare and contrast about, but I'm going to share the comparison and contrast the mindset of self of how we live by natural tendencies, just as human beings, it's just what we do, and compare that to the mindset of the spirit. And at the end of the night, once you've seen the self and the spirit, you can make the decision on your own each and every day what you want to live in. So the mindset of self, some of the things that I've walked through in my own life, the mindset of self, and I think one of the biggest ones that we live, that we live with and that we deal with on a regular and a constant and recurring basis is the mindset of self that says, uh, my life is built upon what I have done. It's all about me. I am the master of my own destiny, and I am in control of everything that happens to me, good and bad. This goes all the way back to the very beginning of creation. In Genesis, the third chapter, we have the account of the fall of man. 
And there Eve eats this fruit. She passes it to her husband. Adam, he eats this fruit. Now all of a sudden their eyes are open to the, to the difference between good and evil. And the sin nature enters into humanity. And God says to Adam, Adam, why are you hiding from me? And Adam says, we ate this fruit and we realized that we were naked and we were afraid. And God says, why did you eat the fruit? And Adam, like a typical man, passes the buck to his wife and he says, it was the woman you gave me. But God says something amazing in the scriptures that we see in Genesis. And God says to Eve, what have you done? What have you done? And so we live our lives based on that mentality, based on that thought. What have you done? Well, you know what? It's not about what they're doing. It's not about what, I'm, oh, what this guy's doing. It's about what I'm going to do. And I'm going to make my own. You tell me I can't do it. And I'm going to do it on my own. But the problem... The problem that you and I have when we live according to what we have done is that the bar is never, or the bar will always be too high for us to reach. Why? Because while we've done some good things in our lives, we've all done some things in our lives that we've regretted. We've all made bad decisions. We've all had seasons in our lives where our mind was made up and we knew it was not the right decision. And that comes as the form of baggage. And now all of a sudden we start carrying this baggage or these scars because, well, I did that and I shouldn't have done that. I made that decision. I shouldn't have done that. I dated that boy and I knew I shouldn't have dated that boy because I knew what he's after. I went with those guys and, and, and I know I shouldn't have gone back with those guys because I know what they were going to get me into. And, 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 I, and I went to the computer and I know I shouldn't have done it in the middle of the night, whatever it might be. We have all made decisions that weigh us down. And so as we look at this bar of expectations in our own lives with the mindset of my life is built upon what I do, we will always live a life that never reaches the standard that we set for ourselves because we carry the weight of our own baggage and our past. But the mindset of the spirit, which is life and peace, says something completely different. If the mindset of self says that your life is based upon what you have done, then the mindset of the spirit is that your life is based upon what Jesus has done. You are no longer defined by your past. You are no longer identified with the bad and the good decisions that you have made. Why? Because God came and he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross to carry our weight, to carry our shame, to carry our sin. So that when God sees you, he doesn't see who you were. He sees who you are in Jesus Christ. You are the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. He sees what you are because of him. You're worthy. You're worth it. You are priceless to God. There was nothing that he would not give up for you. And despite the mistakes and the things that you've done in your life that try to weigh you down, the good and the bad, you are no longer that person. If there was anybody in the Bible that would understand this, it was Paul the Apostle. Paul was literally to the Christians or to the early church a terrorist. His first job for the church was to seek them out and persecute them. And he all his life had the burden of what he had done to Christians. And Paul says, listen man, I, I, I have this past. I have a storied past. But despite that past, Paul brings us these ideas. In 2 Corinthians he says, listen, the old is gone. And passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is no longer, he says in another chapter or another book, he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Paul the Apostle even says it to the church at Philippi in the book of Philippians. He starts listing out his, his resume. He says, man, you guys want to brag? I, I got bragging rights. I, I can tell you some things. I got some qualifications. I'm educated. I I'm, I I'm up there in the scale of aristocracy. But he says, man, I am the Jew of Jews. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I like how he says, he says, of the stock of Benjamin. Like, I am the manly stock. I was trained under the greatest teacher or one of the greatest teachers of that time. He was a leader of the Sanhedrin. He, 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 he was, and Paul says, man, I was all of this. And then he goes on and he says, but indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, look at, 
for his sake. I have suffered loss in all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And so important, look what he says in this next verse. And be found, look at this, in him. Not in me, not in my past, not in who I am, not in my teacher, not in my pedigree, not in my DNA, not in my tribe, not in my people, not in my race, not in my job, but I might be found in him. Having, uh, or not having righteousness of my own, but having one that comes through faith in Christ. Amen. In the righteousness of God that depends on faith. Amen. And so Paul says, listen, the mindset of the Spirit says that baggage, those decisions that you've made in your life, those things that you've done that you regret, those things that have weighed you down, that's not what identifies you. Because God doesn't see that when he sees you. God sees a child. God sees somebody whom he loves, whom he desires, whom he pursues, whom he saw value in, who he sees worth in, who has a purpose, who has a plan, who has a position for in his kingdom and his place today. You see, you exist today for a reason. And you can know that with the mindset of the spirit that I, my life is not built on the things that I've done. I can achieve greatness according, according to humanity and miss everything in my life spiritually. Or I can fix my eyes on Jesus. I can set my mind according to what God has done. And every day I wake up when I look at myself in the mirror and I say, man, there's nothing worthy about that. I can say, no, I'm going to live according to the mindset of Jesus. And there is a worth because my life is predicated upon what Jesus has done for me. And when you walk out of this place, know that you are identified by Christ in the eyes of of God. The mindset of self so often says that I strive to earn acceptance. I got to work to be accepted by those around me. I remember growing up in, in high school, I always tried to fit into the in crowd. I remember it was, it was kind of a weird experience for me. I, I moved away and went to Oklahoma for two years before I went to university. So I went to Bible college for two years and then I came back and, and I went to uh, university right after that. And I went to California Baptist University and a lot of the in crowd of high school that I tried to fit into ended up going to Cal Baptist. And I remember just trying so hard to kind of like pick up my past and, and try to just be a part of these guys that I was once really close with. And I remember, you know, they, they would gather together and stand in circles and everybody would talk and I'd come from my class and, and I'd try to like squeeze into the circle and I'd always be like the guy on the outside like, hey, hey, uh, oh, and somebody would say, oh, man, yeah, yeah, I've done that too. And they just would never acknowledge me. I remember one time I went to the cafeteria. I didn't even need to eat food. I had a job. I usually came home on my lunch break and worked here at the church. And I remember they were all eating at the cafeteria because they were all living students there. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to fit in with these guys, and I want to hang out and be friends with these guys. And So I went to the cafeteria, and I paid like the $10 for the awful college food that it was. Maybe it's better now. I don't know. It wasn't that great when I was there. And I remember I got my plate. And I sat down at the table with all of them, and they had already finished their lunch, and they all got up and left, and I sat at the table by myself. We strive in life to belong. You know, we all want somebody, like the song says, to lean on, somebody to love us, somebody to see value in us, somebody to accept us. It doesn't matter how introverted, it doesn't matter how rough or how tough you are. We all in life want to feel accepted by somebody. I want to feel loved by somebody. I want to feel valued by somebody. And so often we live in the perspective of the self thinking that i got to work hard to fit in. i got to dress like them and i got to act like them and i got to talk like them and i got to like the sports teams that they like and i got to go to the, to the lunch or to the bar like they do or i got to talk what they talk at work around, around the water cooler in the break room just so I can fit in. Because nobody wants to be on the outside looking in. And so the perspective of self, it's just natural. It's just the, the course of human tendency is for us to say, i got to strive, i got to work at this to get somebody to accept me. But you know, the perspective of the Spirit is completely different. The perspective of the Spirit is I receive acceptance through the love of Jesus. You see, you don't have to work for Jesus to love you. So often we kind of try to put this perspective of self into the spirit of spiritual perspective, and we call it religion. So we say, well, as long as I go to church, Jesus loves me. 
As long as I do good things, God loves me. As long as I don't say bad words, God loves me. As long as I give up my past, God loves me. But can I tell you something? That's contrary to what Paul the Apostle writes in the Word of God. Because God loves you for no, no matter what. As a matter of fact, in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse number 8, we are in Romans chapter 8, verse number 5. I, love, I always love it when it does that, when it flips them. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse number 8. Paul the Apostle writes to the church and he says that God shows his love. He demonstrates his love. He manifests his love. For us, in that, look at this, look at this, look at this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he didn't say, once you were good, once you got your act together, once you worked really hard to be acceptable in the eyes of God, Jesus finally looked at you and said, <laughs> fine. No, as a matter of fact, it says a couple of verses later that you and I were enemies of God, enemies of God at odds against the Spirit of God. And he wanted to show his love for you and for me so much so that while we were enemies, while we were at odds against him, while we were in our sin, while we didn't even know or recognize who Jesus was and what he had done for us, he died for us anyways. And Paul the Apostle later in the, in the 8th chapter of Romans says, I am convinced you cannot take this from me. He says, I am thoroughly convinced that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Not angels, not demons, not principalities, not heights, not depths, not oceans. There is nothing on this earth or in the spiritual world that will separate you from God's love. Why? Because God loves you no matter what you do. I should get a bigger amen for that. Why? Because we walk around all of our lives thinking God is mad at me. But God is mad about you. He's mad for you. He he's loves you so deeply, so richly, so, so immensely that there was no price, no depth that God wasn't willing to go to let you know that he loves you. And you don't got to work for it. You don't got to earn it. All you need to do is accept it, is receive it, is to say, God, I don't feel loved. But you say you love me, and I'll say you love me. And open your heart to the love of God and let him, Romans the fifth chapter says, pour into your hearts the love of God. He loves you madly. He loves you. But there are too many people that have tried to take the mindset of the self and put it into the mindset of the spirit and say, only as long as I go to church. Only as long as I don't go back to my past. Only as long as I do good things. Only as long as I give money into the offering bucket. But let me tell you something. God loves you no matter what you do. No matter what you do. God loves you. Not only does he love you. He loves that person that drives you nuts. He loves that person that you can't stand. He loves that guy on the other side of the world that wants to cut a Christian's head off for their faith. He loves those people on the other side of the world that don't believe in any type of deist. God loves humanity so much, Jesus said, that he gave his only begotten son. God loves you. God loves you. And don't you dare let anybody or anything tell you otherwise. Because let me tell you something. The mindset of self and the devil will creep into your mind and tell you you're not worthy, you're not worth it, God's mad at you, God can't stand you, you are dirty, you are filthy. But God says, I love you. I desire you. And you know what? Yeah, you might be messing up, but I love you and I think you're better than this. And I got better plans for you. I got a better future than you think. I got, I got better ideas than you have. I've got better blessings than you could ever pursue on yourself. And all you and I need to do in our lives is sit back and receive the love of God into our lives. I think oftentimes the resistance to preachers saying that is that a lot of times they might just stop with that. And honestly, in my own opinion, I think that if we would grab a hold of the love of God, that everything in our lives would change and we wouldn't have to explain anything else. But you know, there's one more perspective I wanted to talk about tonight. And this is one that for me, even growing up in church, 
And even, even, even seeing it, I struggled with for years. And that is the perspective of self says, I am burdened to oblige God's will. You know, Dad used to say it like this. Pastor Jim used to say it like this. You see Christians walking around looking like they're sucking on lemons. You ever met somebody like that? If that's you, don't raise your hand. Don't say anything. Just, just look forward. I pray tonight that changes. Because, you know, there's so many Christians walking around sacrificing their lives to God. Martyrs for the kingdom of God, so to speak, because they're enduring or obliging God's will. But, you know, that's contrary to what Jesus said. Because Jesus said, I came to give you life. To give you life more abundantly. But it seems like there are so many Christians today. that They get wrapped up in what God is doing. <clears throat> they get wrapped up in the laws and the rules and the regulations and, and the thou shalt not. I mean, did you know? Maybe you didn't. Because you probably don't know all ten of them. Most Americans probably don't even know all ten commandments. But did you know that eight out of the ten commandments are thou shalt not? So often we look at God and we say, God... You took all the fun out of my life. I was having all the fun and then I found Jesus and now I can't do this. And now I can't do that. Now I can't talk like this. And now I can't watch those TV shows. And I can't drink this and I can't smoke that. All of the fun is gone and all I just sit down. Well, I guess I'll just wait until I get to heaven. And then we become Christians that look like we're sucking on lemons. Because we're obliged to follow and to serve God. I'm burdened, it's heavy. As a matter of fact, we look at scriptures and we say, man, you think the law was tough. But Jesus made it tougher. The law says don't commit adultery, dudes. Jesus says that if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes and her intent in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. The law says do not commit murder. Jesus says if you're angry at your brother, you're already guilty of murder. And we look at these statements and it's like Jesus came not to give us life, but to turn the screws tighter. To hold the bar higher. And that brings discouragement because we'll never achieve that bar. We'll never live through the standards of what we think we could. I mean, even the, the apostles talking about the Old Testament law said, how can we put upon these people that have no concept of these rules that we have in Judaism and put that upon them? And we struggle ourselves to even keep that. But the reality is they're not obligations. And they're not burdens. Because the very same person that said, that we say, wow, he really turned the screws tight on us with those types of statements, said, come to me, you who are heavy laden and tired, and take my yoke. He didn't say be free. He said, take my yoke. A yoke is not like an egg yoke. And I think we think of like, what's, an egg? what's a yoke? Jesus talking, what's he talking about eggs all the time? A yoke would tie, it was a piece of wood that would, would hold or bind two big oxen together so that they would pull a plow before they had tractors. And so he says, come, and be bound, connected to me. He says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. But how could his yoke be easy and his burden be light if it's so hard to live up to the standard that Jesus set? But I think it's all a matter of perspective. Because, you know, this world is tearing itself apart. There's no question about that. You know, America is becoming more and more polarized as every day goes by. People are less and less apt to listen to each other and more apt to shout their opinions at each other and to spew their beliefs over somebody else's and not have conversations anymore. We're all closed-minded. And as we polarize and as we go further and further down, it's amazing that these thou shalt nots, these ten rules that God gave, if, if we, as humans... We just look at these Ten Commandments and just live by them. We wouldn't have to worry about murder because it says don't murder. We wouldn't have to worry about disobedient children because it says children obey your parents. We wouldn't have to worry about adultery because it says don't covet your neighbor's wife and don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. We wouldn't have to worry about stealing and cheating because it says don't do these things. We wouldn't have to worry about envy because it says don't be envious of things. God actually gave these rules not to hinder people but to empower them. To live a life of meaning and of purpose. But the mindset of self says these are hard. These are rules and these are regulations. But Jesus took ten rules and he simplified them even further into two. He says if you want to obey all of these rules in the Bible, all of these laws in the Old Testament, if you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself, 
You'd fulfill all of that. Because the mindset of the Spirit is contrary. It's life and it's peace. And the mindset of the Spirit says, I am overjoyed to serve. I'm overjoyed to serve. I don't have to serve Jesus. You don't have to do anything for Jesus. My daddy used to tell us this every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and Friday night, when we as little kids would go to church and we wouldn't understand why. Dad, why do we have to go to church again? Son, you don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. As a kid, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, 17 years old, it's like, thanks, Dad. <laughs> As an adult, you look at some of these rules, thanks, Jesus. But the truth of the matter is, is that God doesn't want you to serve from a position of having to. Come on. Come on. He didn't come to tighten the screws in your life. Did you know, if anything, he came to loosen the pressure of your life? He came to kind of back off that pressure that you've been living on. Why? Because you, you, you're good enough at getting into pressure yourself. You and I, we are experts at screwing things up in our own lives. And Jesus just simply said, hey, I'm going to come and fix this. And because I'm going to come and fix this, you get to serve me. You get to live a life that has meaning. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to share your faith. You don't have to obey the laws of, of the Bible. You don't have to abstain from fornication and adultery and all these things. You don't have to. You get to do that. Why? Because God wants to take you to a better place. And the things that he tells you not to do are the things that will hold you back from the things that he wants to take you to. And that's why, probably for me as a Christian, one of the most difficult verses for me to ever comprehend in the Bible. There's a lot of hard ones. But was this in 1 John, the fifth chapter. John says, and we keep the commandments of God because we love him. And his commandments are not burdensome. But when I look at it like, man, I looked at that. I'm mad at my brother. Shoot, I'm a murderer. Guys, and you look at that girl, you're like, dang. No, oh, shoot, I'm an adulterer. It's like we cannot do that. We say, how are his commandments not burdensome? Because we don't look at it from the perspective of do not do this. We look at it from the perspective of Jesus Christ loves me. That he desires for me. My life is identified and wrapped up in what Jesus has already done. My, my love doesn't come from my works. It comes from what Jesus has done for me. And that God loves me and sees me as his child. And I'm already accepted. And because I'm accepted. And because I'm loved. And because I'm identified in Jesus Christ. I am overjoyed to not try to cheat on my wife. I am overjoyed to not hold on to frustrations and anger and bitterness. I am overjoyed to live a life of meaning and purpose and abundance as though Jesus told me I would live. It is a privilege for me to serve God. And now when you wake up in the morning, you look at your life and you say, man, I made some bad decisions yesterday. Yep, so did I. But we can say, what am I going to make up my mind about? I'm going to wake up today. And I'm going to make up my mind, and then I'm going to make up my bed. <laughs> that my life is not defined on what I did yesterday. That my life is defined on what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. It's already been defined for me. That today when I wake up, I don't have to work at being accepted by everybody else. Because if nobody else on this world accepts me, but you will find people that will, if nobody else in this world accepts me, nonetheless, I'm already accepted by the creator of the universe, the God Most High, the one who sets the stars in the sky. And I'm not obliged. I'm not sucking on lemons because I don't get to do these things anymore. God says, I don't want you to be wrapped up in bondage and addictions, and things that take control of your life. I want you to experience freedom. I want you to experience life. I want you to experience love as I have intended for you. And you and I, we are blessed, overjoyed to get up in the morning and say, God, whatever it is you have for me, I'm going to do it because you see what's best for me. Your perspective is better than my perspective.
In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is finishing up his life. He's about, he's about to die. God had told Moses because of something that he had done that he wouldn't lead the people into the promised land. So they had spent 40 years wandering in the Arabian desert. Finally, they're at the borders of the promised land, which is today modern-day Israel. And Moses is at the end of his life. And Joshua is about to succeed Moses in leadership and lead these group of people, a new generation of, of Hebrews or of Jewish people, into the, the land uh, that God had promised them. And Moses says, and he recounts the story, and he kind of goes back, and Deuteronomy kind of gives us all the whole like, rundown of what had happened. Moses is speaking to the people what God spoke to him. And God says to the people of Israel, See, I have set before you today life and death. You just pop that one up for me. Good and evil. Verse number 16, he goes on and he says, If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God and walking in his ways. And he goes on and he says, and keep his commandments and his statutes and his rules. You shall live and multiply. Think about it. If you obey, if, if you would just change your perspective, these rules and regulations are not to hinder your life. They're to propel your life. And if you do these things, your life will be better. Your life will be good. Your life will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. Your finances will be blessed. Your sheep and your goats, and you need your sheep and goats blessed. Your sheep and your goats will be blessed. You're like, I don't have sheep and goats, dollars and cents. You can think of it like that. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but you turn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not live long in the land that you are going over to the Jordan and, and to enter and possess. If you want to live according to the mindset of yourself and do what you want to do, how you want to do it, let me just tell you, God is saying, you can do it, but your life will not be very good. Because I see God's, the way I think of it like this is God says, I see things from a higher elevation than you do. I see things so much more clearly. If you would just listen to me, if you would just follow me, I will make your life better. And he says, I call heaven and earth today as witnesses against you. I've set before you, once again, he says this, life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life. Amen. Every day, you and I have a decision. In every argument we face, in every hardship that we go through, in every valley that we cross, every mountain that we climb, we have a decision. Will I make up my mind to see things how I want to see them? Or will I make up my mind to see things how God wants me to see them? And every day when we wake up, if you'd make up your decision, make up your mind, to live that day knowing that you were not de defined by what you did yesterday. You are defined by what Jesus Christ did. Amen. That you do not have to earn God's love. He already gave it to you freely. All you need to do is receive it. And that you're not burdened to follow his commandments, but you are overjoyed because of what he has done for you to serve. You know what's so amazing is that you and I don't just serve Jesus we don't just work for Jesus. We work with Jesus. We are co-heirs, co-laborers in Christ. I think of it like this, and I'm done with this. I think sometimes Jesus wakes up, you wake up in the morning, Jesus is waiting on you. What you want to do today? You say, I want to go here. Let's do it. Let's do it. You are co-workers with Christ, building and revealing his kingdom through who you are and the mindset of the spirit, life and peace. Every day you wake up, behold, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Choose life. Choose life. Make up your mind to live according to the spirit. You guys get something out of that? Not complex, not a lot to it, but those are some things that when I started making the decision, when I wake up in the morning to live according to that, I tell you, joy came into my life, 
Purpose came into my life. Fulfillment came into my life. My relationship with my wife got better. I love my kids more. When I step on Legos, I have downgraded the words that I said. They've gone to a smaller level of words. And, you know, I tell you, it's just a journey. If you and I would do that, I tell you what, God's going to take us places that we would never have ever dreamed or imagined because that is the life of Jesus Christ ahead of us. Amen? Amen. Praise God.